I think that's like the third time I could have just said amen and the service would have been done and I, it would have already been great at that, right? But uh, we're excited for what God wants to keep doing and he's doing so many things in our city and in our church and in our lives. We're just so thankful to him for it. And so we are gonna turn to our message here and I wanna let you know that the odds were stacked against it. In fact, there was only a one in 66 chance that we were gonna talk about 1 John this morning and guess what, we're kicking off a whole new series on 1 John today. And so this is a series that's gonna cover uh, Sunday morning topics, and then if you want some unique content and you wanna connect into some more friendships and relationships at Christ Community, then Journey Groups is a place that you could go and just kinda get the whole package of First John. Now is probably the best time of the year that you could dive in there. And uh, as we looked at, what do we talk about next? Out of the 66 books, we landed on First John. We just thought it was really important. Why is that? Because over and over again, John helps us know our faith. He often says, this is how we know. And so today our message answers the question, how do we know that it's true? In other words, how do we know that this Jesus stuff is really true? I mean, this stuff that has been debated and talked about for thousands of years, this stuff that people have tried to rip holes in our faith, how can we know that it's really true? Well, John says, yes, it is true, and not only that, but he helps us engage our hearts and our minds in this discovery of knowing how it's true, and so that when doubt comes, when difficult situations come, when our feelings tell us otherwise, when the world is pressing in against us in our faith, we can say, no, 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 I know that it is true. Some quick things that you should know about 1 John is that it was written by a guy named John, and he also wrote uh, more books in the New Testament than anybody except for one other guy named Paul, yeah. And as John wrote uh, this book of 1 John, he wrote it from the city of um, Ephesus. And uh, you might not know that it was the latest written New Testament book. We think it was written around 90 AD or so, along with 2 and 3 John, which is kind of also an interesting tidbit because it's the, you know, part of this three book series that John writes. And then one other last piece of trivia is that in the NIV, the 173rd word is blood, okay? Just so you know, like if you're trying to test your friends, were you in church today, dude? Prove it, prove it. What's the 173rd word in 1 John? And you'll, that's the only way that you're gonna know they're in church, all right? Bible trivia for the know-it-all. That's something you probably didn't know walking in here this morning. Well, today we're looking at just those first four verses, and so if you wanna turn there, you can follow along on the screens. 1 John 1, 1 through 4, and here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at this passage from a few different angles, and hopefully the goal is that we become experts in some knowledge, but also how to live this verse out. Does that sound good to you today? Good, good, good. Well, the first time we read through it, we're gonna look at it from the point of view of what does John teach us about Jesus? I mean, just try to think, uh, approach this passage uh, with the mindset of if I didn't know anything about Jesus at all, what could I learn about him just from these four short verses? And so just kind of, if you wanna take notes on that as we read through or just wanna remember it in your mind and we'll review it here in just a moment. And here's how it goes. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this will we proclaim concerning the word of life. That life appeared, we've seen it and we testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. And so we're just gonna comb through verse by verse and say what? can we learn about Jesus from these verses? And the first thing we learn in verse one starts off, it says that which was from the beginning. We learn that Jesus was from the beginning. He's not a created being, he just is. He's always existed. We also learn from verse one there, uh, jump down near the end, it says that he was the word of life. Now there's a lot of religions out there that give words about life. Jesus is not a word about life. He's not a self-help book. He's not a way to make our life better. Jesus is the word of life. There's a huge 
difference there because outside of Jesus, there is no life. Whether we're talking spiritual life or physical life, the only reason any of that is not just all death is because of Jesus. He is the word of life. Verse two, what else can we learn about Jesus? We learn there that uh, this life that he appeared and then later on it says he was with the Father and he has appeared to us. You know, Jesus appeared to us. This is God became man. We couldn't have seen God, we couldn't have known the Father except for what he's chosen to make known to us. And he said, I want people to know me and so I'm gonna have my son appear that they might know him. I hear a lot of people say, God is kinda hard to understand. It's hard to figure out what he's like. He's so big, he's so out there sometimes. And you know what I say to them is, do you wanna know what God is like? Look at what Jesus is like. John says, you wanna know what God is like? Well, he appeared to us as Jesus Christ. When we see Jesus, we're seeing God himself, God in the flesh, so that you and I could know the Father. Verse three, continuing on, it says that uh, we proclaim to you what we've seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship, fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. What else do we learn about Jesus is that we can have fellowship with him. Isn't that amazing that we can have fellowship with God himself as mere human beings, fellowship, relationship with God Almighty. And then we learn that uh, the Father, and it says, and with his son. We learn that Jesus, he is the son of God. I was thinking back to when I was in college before I was stricken with uh, male pattern baldness and uh, I remember asking my professor, I said, does the father ever kind of get jealous of Jesus? Have you ever wondered this before? You know, I was like, you know, does he ever think like, I, I'm so proud of my son and whatever, but like, hey guys, like don't forget about me up here. Like after all, I am like Father God up here, all right? And my professor was like, actually no. No, he doesn't ever get tired of us focusing on Jesus because when we give attention to Jesus, we give attention to the Father. When we give our focus to Jesus Christ, we give our focus to the Father because Jesus is the Son of God, he is God. He and the Father are one. It is impossible to overemphasize Jesus in our lives. We can never get to the point where we could say, I think I have a little too much Jesus in my life. I'm gonna tone down this Jesus thing. You can't do it. I was also thinking about how six years ago, uh, my wife and I were at the hospital uh, giving birth to our son. She did most of the hard work. And, um, <laughs> and as we got pretty far into the delivery process though, uh, we quickly realized that things were not going well. How did we know that? Well, there's all kinds of machines that are beeping. You know when lots of extra hospital staff rush into the room, uh, this isn't good. And they were beginning to use this suction cup on his head because they needed to get our son out as quickly as possible. He wasn't getting the air that he needed to be able to breathe right. And I remember when he was finally delivered, there was this moment where my wife asked, how's the baby? And for what seemed like a long minute or two, there was just silence. And then finally somebody broke that silence and they said, he's okay, he's fine. And the image I have of that day is of the doctor kind of wrangling my son, like holding him under her arm and unwrapping the umbilical cord from around his neck. One, two, three, four, five, six different times. No one at the hospital had ever seen more than three, and my theory is that he was practicing some Jedi training in there and just <laughs> kinda got tangled up a little. Who knows what he was doing? And besides that unwrapping, the other part I remember of that delivery is just me not knowing what to say or do, feeling helpless, and the only words that my mouth could say were just Jesus, 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 because I knew in that moment I couldn't get too much of him. We needed him in our lives at that moment. That was the only prayer that I could utter in those times. And so in hospital moments, in everyday moments, we cannot overemphasize Jesus Christ. 
You know, growing up, I'd always heard that Jesus was the healer. I had seen him heal other people's lives, but it wasn't until I touched Jesus' healing in my life that day that I was able to fully say, yes, Jesus, he is our healer. And so John, he focuses on Jesus quite a bit in his writings, and we focus on Jesus here at Christ Community Church because there is no one or nothing worth focusing on more than Jesus Christ. And whether we're hearing these truths that John writes about for the first time or for the thousandth time this morning, it is so good, isn't it, to focus on Jesus Christ. He is what our faith is all about. You know, sometimes I think we can get to the point in our faith where we begin to feel pretty good about how far we've come along. But until every moment of every day is completely about Jesus Christ, then we've got room to grow. And that's what John tells us here. I wanna look at these verses again, and the second way I wanna comb through these verses is through the eyes of John as an eyewitness. And as we read, notice what he heard, what he saw, what he touched regarding Jesus in world history. Here's how it goes as we uh, go through again here. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and, with, looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and we testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. You know when you're sitting around talking about a sporting event or an event like 9-11 and somebody who's there talking with you speaks up and says, I was there, what do you do? Don't you like lean in and begin to listen because you wanna hear their firsthand eyewitness account of what it was like to be there. And the same is true about John. How do we know that this stuff he's saying about Jesus is really too, that we can build our lives and our faith around it? Well, because he was there. He was an eyewitness to all this stuff. In verse one he says, uh, we have heard about him, we have seen it with our eyes, we've touched it with our hands. And when he says that, you lean in and you say, okay John, tell me, what was it like to be with Jesus? You know, thinking about that hear, see, touch, to have heard was pretty special, right? But there were actually quite a few people in the Old Testament that had heard the voice of God, but to have seen, wow, that was even more compelling, but to have touched was conclusive proof that Jesus was God made flesh, appeared to us. Tying this into our sermon theme, how do I know that Jesus is really true. Well, because for one reason, we have this very accurate written account of an eyewitness of Jesus that's been copied and preserved for us throughout the ages that tells us what he's like. It was written by John who had heard, seen, and touched Jesus himself. I just flipped through the Gospel of John and you begin to see and remember some of the things that Jesus and John experienced together. I mean, can you see John saying something like this? He would say, I was there when Jesus cleared the temple. In fact, one of the cows almost trampled me. I was there when Jesus told the man who had been crippled for 38 years to get up and take his mat and to walk, and then the guy actually did it. I was there when Jesus took five loaves and two small fish and he multiplied them and he fed a crowd of 5,000 people. I was there when Jesus told people to eat his flesh and to drink his blood, and because of that, many people left but we knew that he wasn't speaking literally. He was just telling us that we need to follow him radically. And we decided to do that with our lives. I was there when Jesus was there and, and a scared woman was drugged before him. She had been caught in adultery. And I remember when Jesus bent over and he began to write in the sand. And I remember when that crowd walked away and they dropped their rocks. And when Jesus looked that woman in the eye with grace and truth and he said, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. I was there when Jesus turned spit and dirt into mud and he restored sight to a man. I was there when Jesus made the Pharisees eat their words over and over again. I was there when Jesus wept for our friend Lazarus who had died and I was there when Jesus raised him from the dead. 
I was there when Jesus took us to the Big Ten Chariot Race Championships. And our team, the Jerusalem Brickmakers, won it all that season. I just didn't have space to write about that in the gospel. God said not to. (laughs) I was there when Jesus predicted his death. And with his own hands, he washed my dirty feet. And when he ate that Passover meal with us, one of us being somebody who was later that night gonna betray him to his death. I was there just after he had prayed for us so deeply that he had sweat blood in agony in the garden. I was there when he was arrested, when he was crucified, and when hanging on the cross, he looked at me and said, this is my mom. Take care of her. And I was one of the first ones who was at the tomb after, uh, after Jesus' death. And then, of course, I learned that he has resurrected because he wasn't there anymore. I was there when Thomas put his fingers into the nail holes in Jesus' body. I can still remember the squishy sound that it made. I was there when Jesus appeared to us multiple times after the resurrection, teaching, loving, eating with us. And I was there when Jesus ascended into heaven so that he could leave his Holy Spirit with us. Wow, these are things that John had heard, things that he had seen and touched. He was an eyewitness. And by the time he's writing these things down for us in 90 AD, he was the only disciple that was still left alive. All the others, every single one of them had died, not one of them peacefully either. Some by crucifixion, others by stoning, by beheading, all of them died a martyr's death. You wanna know another reason, how do I know that it's true? How do I know Jesus is true? Well, because there's no way that John is writing this stuff. There's no way that John is going all out for Jesus if he had been there to see it and he would have known that this stuff isn't really true. No, he believed it because he saw it. And he was willing to live and die for what he saw. John's authority to write what he writes, his authority to make five of his writings included in the 66 books we have that make up the Bible. What is his authority? Well, he was an eyewitness. You know, every so often in popular culture in the news, we hear about this new secret gospel that's come out, right, with these new stories and findings and sayings or stories about Jesus. You know why those books aren't included in scripture? There's a few reasons, but for one, it's because the people who wrote those, they weren't an eyewitness. They came along maybe 100, sometimes 300 years after Jesus was on earth. In contrast, John writes, and he can speak with authority because he heard, because he saw, because he touched Jesus as he did those things. And because of John's eyewitness account, we can know that these things about our faith are true. And then I wanna comb through these verses one more time through the eye of you and I as an eyewitness. John was an eyewitness, but we have a role in this story as well. We're eyewitnesses to what God has done in our lives. These events that John talks about happened maybe a couple thousand years ago, but you know what? You are an expert in what God has done in your life. In fact, you're the world-renowned expert in what God has done in your life. And so as we read, think about how you've heard and seen and you've touched Jesus in your life. It says this again, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. You know, I've heard people try to rip apart Christian beliefs. I've heard people try to disprove the Bible. I've heard people try to uh, disprove the existence of God. I've seen people twist theology to make it mean what they want it to mean. But I don't know that I've ever heard a Christian tell their story of their experience with God and somebody be like, no, no. I I don't think that happened. I don't know that I've ever heard that. I don't know that I've ever told my story about my son and said, oh yeah, the uh, cord was wrapped around his neck six times and he almost died, but thanks to God, he rescued him. 
And even the doctor who wasn't a believer said, wow, this is a miracle that your son is completely fine. I've never told that story and somebody said, "Uh, yeah, Brad, I don't believe that that happened. It's never once happened in my life. You know, in this day and age where unfortunately experience is placed with more importance than absolute truth, our stories as Christians have gained all that much more importance. The potential they have for life-changing impact is amazing. And so check this out. As followers of Jesus, the more aware I think we are of God's work in our lives, the more we're listening for him to speak, the more we're looking for him in our lives, the more we're touching him in our everyday lives, the more we're aware of those things, the more likely it is that we're gonna be able to share those things with the people around us, that we would tell the old, old story. And so in our lives that we'd be looking for experiences with God and that we'd be talking about them naturally with the people around us, both Christians and people who don't yet know Jesus Christ as their savior. We did a little survey with our high school students last week and we said to them, hey, where do you need help sharing your faith? And they said one of their top needs is this, learning how to guide conversations to spiritual things just in a very natural and relational way. And I wonder if that isn't also a similar need for us as adults as well, that we would be able to, in a completely and natural way, just talk about our faith in a natural, unforced, everyday kind of a conversations kind of a way that when somebody tells us about their doctor appointment that didn't go so well, we can say, hey, would it be okay if I told you about how God has healed me at different times in my life? When somebody tells us how stressed out and exhausted they are, that we could say to them, hey, would it be okay if I told you about how I've been simplifying my life and finding rest in Jesus Christ? And I used to be like that, but it's changed me. That when somebody shares with us maybe their financial difficulties, that we'd be able to say, can I share with you how God has provided in my life in some amazing ways? That when we see somebody who's lacking hope, that we can say, can I tell you about Jesus Christ and how we can find hope and relationship with him. Yes, I know it's true that talking about our faith is potentially an offensive topic with many people, but the bottom line is this. I think we talk about the stuff that we're already passionate about. We talk about the stuff we're passionate about. I mean, how many of us in this room are huge college football fans? And when you know that you're going somewhere where you're gonna be talking about college football, do you have to like study up and research on ESPN stats and all that? Are you nervous? Like, I hope somebody doesn't ask me about this. No, you just go and just, you just talk about it. It becomes easy, it becomes natural. You're passionate about it and so you talk about it. How many of us in this room are passionate about gardening and landscaping and you don't have to research that stuff, you just know it, you know? You know the best way to get rid of, uh, of rabbits that are eating all your plants. You don't have to research that before a conversation. It's just easy to talk about. You think about the things you're passionate about and you think how easy they are to talk about. And now, I don't wanna be too hard on us because I know that as Christians, we probably experience more guilt when it comes to not sharing our faith maybe than anything else in the Christian life. But I just wonder if it's so easy for us to talk about temporal things. And we rarely ever talk about Jesus Christ with people who don't know him. It makes me wonder what we're truly passionate about. But here's the deal, it doesn't have to be this polished or pushy uh, gospel presentation kind of a thing. It's just us sharing our eyewitness account of how God has invaded our lives. It's us sharing what we've heard, what we've seen, what we've touched in our spiritual life. You know, it was a couple weeks ago that we uh, talked about these two by two cards that I'm holding up right here. And the idea was uh, put on there two friends that you have who don't yet, or family members who don't yet know Jesus Christ as their savior and pray for them two minutes a day. And so today I kinda wanted to give you a little bit of a reminder of that. But I also wanna challenge us to take the next step at that. To take it a step further and encourage you to tell your story and to get good at it. Tell your story and to get good at it. Stories of God intersecting your life. 
I know for me, I've got a story about when I first came to faith in Jesus. I've got a story about when as a teenager, I really started putting Jesus first in my life and how that's changed my life. I have a story of how God has provided financially for my family when we had four kids and I didn't have a steady job for six months and yet God took amazing care of us. I have stories of when God healed my son and my daughter and myself. I have stories of when I heard God speak to me and told me to do kind of crazy things and how I obeyed him and how that's turned out for the good. I have stories of God at work in my life. And I wonder for you, what stories do you have to tell? As we were singing those songs about telling your story, what stories was God putting in your mind that just made you belt out those words because you are so excited about what God has done in your life? And so on your program, I'm gonna encourage you to go ahead and take these out now. On the back there it says, tell your story and get good at it. Tell your story and get good at it. And it has five questions on there and each one of these questions, the hope is is that it would prompt you to think through your stories. Maybe you're gonna have stories that go with each of these prompts. Maybe you're gonna have stories that just go with two or three of these prompts. What I wanna do is I wanna give us some time for reflection. In fact, right now, right in the middle of our service, what stories do you have to tell? We wanna encourage you to tell your story and to get good at it. And so for this exercise, we're not gonna encourage you to uh, write out your whole story, but just to write out some bullet points under uh, some of those stories. And, And we're gonna give you time to do that. And then from here, I've got three more things that I would love for you to do. One of those things is this. I want you to today, this is a challenge, so that you don't forget about it, whatever, that you would today share one of these stories with somebody. Whether it's over the lunch table with your family or a friend, or you call somebody up today and you just share your story, you begin to practice telling your story really well. Second thing I'd love for you to do is uh, take one of your stories that you've bulleted out this morning and to just kind of write it out more in story, more in paragraph kind of a form, like a story that maybe is your best of your best stories and get really good at writing it out and telling it. And the third thing I would love for you to do is pray this week that you would have an opportunity before we see each other again next Sunday to share that story with somebody who doesn't yet know Jesus Christ. And so you're gonna bullet out your stories as the music is playing and you're gonna tell your story to somebody today And you're gonna take one of those and write it out. And then you're gonna pray for an opportunity to share that story this week. My hope as I was praying, as I was getting ready for today, would not be that this was that this wouldn't just be an exercise that's kind of a nice thing that maybe a handful of us do. But I was praying that God would really prompt in us the opportunity and the need to be sharing our stories. And that we wouldn't just go home saying, oh, that was a nice service and forget about this, but we'd really live this out and do these steps and just with anticipation see what God is gonna do as we begin to tell and rehearse our stories. And so right now, again, the music's gonna begin playing. We're just gonna give you a few moments to uh, bullet out your stories, practice by telling that story over lunch today. If you've got a great story, like Tim said earlier, you can go to cccomaha.org slash stories and you can share that with us too. And then in a couple moments after you're done writing, the uh, worship team will come up and they'll close us out. Go ahead and take a few moments to bullet out your stories of God at work and your life.